to our service, let's pray together the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Reminding ourselves of the summary of the law, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbors as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. My dear brothers and sisters, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses, not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts that we may obtain forgiveness by His infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God. 
but especially when we come together in his presence to give thanks for the great benefits we've received at his hands, to declare his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things which are necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, draw near with me to the throne of heavenly grace. Praying together, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we have ought to have done, and we've done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no health in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults, Restore all those who are penitent according to your promises declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, desires not the death of sinners, but that they may turn from their wickedness and live. He is empowered and commanded his ministers to pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardons and absolves all who truly repent and sincerely believe his holy gospel. For this reason, we beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that our present deeds may please him, the rest of our lives may be pure and holy, and then at the last we may come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's say together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's listen to the Word of God. Our scripture reading for this morning is taken from the book of Exodus, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, 
and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what has been done to you in Egypt, and I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. And they will listen to your voice, and you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us, and now please let us go a three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and when you go, you shall not go empty. But each woman shall ask of her neighbor and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A couple of months ago, you'll remember that sudden windstorm that hit our area, and it did considerable damage, especially when trees like this were literally uprooted and fell on houses and cars. It was very dangerous. As someone who studied forestry years ago, it's always fascinated me how extensive a tree's root system is. And yet, of course, despite it, even if the wind is strong enough and roots are shallow, the tree might come down. You might have probably figured out where I'm going with this. There are many biblical images of roots in both the Old and the New Testament. We are a people that have a story that is rooted, as it were, in a bigger story. And that's how I look at the entire Bible, especially when I try to understand the Old Testament. The story of Israel was never simply a story of a people going through history hoping for something better. It was always a story, even in the earliest of traditions, shot through with the strange sense that the God who made the world wants actually to live with and amongst his people. We see this in the story when God calls Abraham. God promises Abraham that he would be the descendant of many people. Abraham journeys to and fro, 
And wherever he goes, he builds a shrine and calls on the name of the Lord. So too with Jacob, who has this extraordinary vision of a ladder with God at the top and the angels coming and going. Jacob calls the place where he had this uh, vision Bethel, which means the house of God. And we see this particularly at the time of the Exodus. It's easy to get weighed down in all of the traumatic events of the book of Exodus, but the thing to keep your eye on is what Moses says to Pharaoh. Let us go so that we may worship our God in the wilderness. And I used to think that that was just an excuse to what Moses really wanted, to escape and take his people to the promised land. Actually, the way that the book of Exodus works, when the people come out of Egypt and through the wilderness, they're given the law. And they are also given in great detail instructions for the building of the tabernacle. This is the place where God is going to come to dwell with them. And so God is already leading them with the pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. But they now have to build this strange holy tent so that God will come and actually live in their midst. Now, you fast forward to the New Testament, and of course, you know that in Jesus Christ, we see the perfect revelation of God in the midst of his people, because even Jesus' name, Emmanuel, means God is with us. All of this to say that our story, your story, is part of a bigger story that is rooted in God. So let's pray before we look at the story of Moses in the book of Exodus. Let's pray. Well, Father, I thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations in all of our hearts be truly acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. And if you'd like to follow along, get out your Bibles and turn to the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, second book of the Bible, chapter 3. Now, the story of the Exodus is probably one of the greatest, as it were, travel logs in all of history. It is a story of navigation. It's a story where Moses had only the Lord as his compass. From Exodus, we can learn some really important lessons concerning our journey, our story. Now, because of its importance, the encounter between God and Moses is recorded in considerable detail with much attention being focused on their conversation. And clearly, the entire event had a profound effect upon Moses. So Exodus 3, verses 1 to 6. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, or Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off, for the place on which you are standing is 
holy ground. One day, Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro. Notice that it is in the ordinary, day-to-day life of Moses that God chooses to reveal his glory to him. Moses wasn't at church. He wasn't on a spiritual retreat. He wasn't fasting, praying, or even reading his Bible. But God chooses to appear to Moses on a Monday morning at work. All of life is sacred. Each moment has the wonderful opportunity of encountering our God. Have you ever had a burning bush experience? Maybe not a literal burning bush, but you know that you know that you've encountered the living God. And it proved to be a real turning point in your life. One bishop put it this way, as I see it, Much of Western Christianity has become entrenched in the cerebral, the rationalistic, with a tendency to be hostile to to the experiential dimensions of the Christian faith, especially if things become just a little too enthusiastic, demonstrative, or emotional. All that to say is that we have a faith where we can personally encounter a real God. And I am convinced that Moses was able to continue the journey, mind you, a 40-year long journey in the desert because he experienced God. I think if he would have only read about God or even faithfully went to to church or Sunday school, he would have given up rather quickly if he did not know God personally. Notice in the passage that God is revealed as holy. Verse 5, Do not come near. Take off your sandals, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Because of his awesome nature, God had to be approached with caution. And so Moses acknowledges God's holiness by removing his sandals. You see, the concept of divine holiness reappears in Exodus as a major theme. Having led his father-in-law's father-in-law's flock through the desert to Horeb, or Mount Sinai, the mountain of God, Moses will later lead the Israelites to that same location. That's found in chapter 19, where they also will be confronted by God's holy presence revealed through fire. And I often think of fire in connection with purity the awesome, holy presence of God. And there's always got to be that balance, right? Between a God who wants to have a close relationship with us, while at the same time, he is holy. As you know, if we truly want to maintain a healthy relationship with God, we must continue with a complete lifestyle that is worthy of God. Our life is to be holy as well. Not because God is like a busybody, you know, you know, meddling with our lives, but because human beings are made in his image, designed to reflect his glory with every facet of our personality. So our behavior is not then a matter of a few rules, you know, made up by a heavenly politician or a police officer, but a matter of reflecting 
God's essence, his person, his glory in every part of your life and mine. Back to the passage. Although the background details are noteworthy, the narrative focuses much attention on this dialogue between God and Moses. From the outset, it was essential that God should know the identity of the one who spoke to him. Verse 6, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Next, God revealed to Moses what the reader already knows. He was passionately concerned about the suffering of his people in Egypt. And now was the time for action. Through Moses, God intends to rescue them from Egypt, a land of oppression, and bring them to Canaan, a land of opportunity. Verse 7, Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and a broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The point is this. God loves us. He identifies with his beloved people. He is not far off. He is not impersonal. Personal. He witnessed. He saw. He heard. He was moved by their struggles and trouble. And God chooses to intervene, to step into it all, because he loves his people. It is the theme of the Bible, and it is at the heart of the ministry of Jesus Christ to step into the pain and the trouble of this world. Someone once said, love, God's love, is the key to life. Not to get what we want, but to become what we ought to be. And I am sure it was because of God's love for Moses that Moses became what he became. But of course, the story doesn't end here. Verse 10, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? God said, But I will be with you. Savor that for a moment. God will be with you. And so Moses obeys God. He was willing, although reluctantly at times, but in essence, Moses heard and obeyed God. And in order for us to navigate the future, we need to be willing to follow and obey the Lord as well. You know that. And there's no use having a compass if you're not going to trust in it. Obedience is the first principle in guidance. And trust and faith are intimately connected when it comes to guidance. If you don't really believe, if we don't really have faith, it is doubtful that we will obey. Faith, rooted in obedience, is the key. Now, Moses' response was hardly surprising. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? In other words, what qualifications had Moses for this task? How could a fugitive from Egypt possibly confront Pharaoh? And God's response was very direct. I will be with you. This was accompanied with the promise of a sign 
However, did God did not promise an instant miracle. Moses had to exercise trust first before seeing those miracles fulfilled. Then, in the dialogue, Moses raises a further difficulty. How would he convince the Israelites that God had sent him to them in the first place? And this leads into the focus on God's identity. Now, scholars have written a lot about the difficulty in trying to translate the text, what God says to Moses. Something like, I am who I am has sent me to you. Moses' request for God's name is important because the Israelites believed that the name of a person reflected an individual's essence, their, their person. In the book of Genesis, different aspects of God's nature are highlighted by the names used to designate him. El Roy, God who sees me, or the God Most High, El Shaddai, God Almighty, El Olam, the eternal God. And here, God introduces himself by the personal name Yahweh, translated in most English versions as the Lord. The Hebrew divine name Yahweh may be translated in a variety of ways. I am who I am. I will be who I will be. I will be what I was. An abbreviated form of this phrase comes in the statement, I am has sent me to you. Unlike previous names, Yahweh, the name Yahweh, does not limit God's nature to a particular characteristic. Instead of the popular phrase you hear these days, you know, it is what it is. Rather, the text is saying, he is what he is. But perhaps the best translation, probably the one that is most known, is I will be who I am. And understood this way, the name Yahweh indicates not just that God is present now, but also that he will be a faithful God for his people in the future, forever. And that, of course, is a very, very comforting thought. That no matter what we are going in the present or even in the future, God is with you and with me. He is, and he always will be faithful to you and to me. God will always be counted on to be who God who is, loving, faithful, caring, responsive. The people of God understood its history from this name, Yahweh, and this name from its history. The name will shape Israel's story, and the Lord is shaping your story too, if you allow him to. Let's pray right now. Father, again, I thank you for my friends gathered. And we call upon the name of the Lord, Yahweh. Lord, we thank you that you are with us now and that you will be with us forever. And so, Lord, we submit right now the things that we're going through, the things that we're going to go through. We pray, Lord, that your presence would be known intimately, experientially, that we would indeed know that the Lord is with us. And all of this we pray through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
Let us pray for the church and for the world. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Archbishop Foley, Bishop Charlie, Bishop Dan, and all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially Justin Trudeau, our Prime Minister, and Doug Ford, our Premier. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. At this time, I would invite you to offer prayers and intercessions of your own, and then I will lead us in further prayer. Lord, we want to lift up to you all those who at this time are struggling to make ends meet. Lord, please help them get the income and the goods that they need to provide for themselves and for their families. And we ask as well, Lord, that you would guide our steps and fill us with your spirit so that we can reach those who need to see and understand the love that you have for them. Help us to be effective servants and great witnesses for the good news about Jesus Christ. Lord, all these things we ask with thanks for the grace that you give to each of us day by day, week by week. And we say once again as a congregation united in Christ, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let's continue by praying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And please join me in praying 
a prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all, for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. of God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful week.